Hello. So um, I'm giving a presentation on Shopify Ship It today, which is uh, a new thing on our engineering blog where we talk about some of the stuff we do internally and publish it externally. So that presentation consists of uh, kind of abbreviated version of the blog post I wrote recently for the engineering blog, which is uh, basically intended to kind of develop a mental model for you for how to think about Nix. But in order to give me give myself more time to talk about how we're actually using Nix at Shopify and showing off some of our development tools, I give a really abbreviated version of that talk at the start of Ship It. So what this is, is the expanded version. So I'm going to walk through uh, how I think about Nix at a kind of intuitive, conceptual level. And if you've read my blog post in the engineering blog, uh, the Shopify engineering blog, the material will be pretty familiar, but I think this is a better way to present it than as a blog post. So you may still get some value out of this. And if not, you may also enjoy reading that post in the engineering blog to, to correlate these two things. So um, this is, I mean, this slide is maybe more of a relic of me giving the presentation for ShipIt, but I'm a production engineer at Shopify. I work in the developer infrastructure team. So, oops, let's skip the slide. So my assertion is, Nix can be the future of computing. Um, but we need to find a better way to explain it first. There's a whole bunch of really great content for, for like learning how to use little corners of Nix and, and figuring out how to do specific things with it, and not a whole lot of content that really teaches you Nix on an intuitive level. And um, my Nixology playlist is, is guilty of this too. Um, the, the thing that I think is missing is, is content that teaches you how to think about Nix on an intuitive level without coming across with like this kind of energy because you know it's literally Ilko's PhD thesis or this kind of energy. Um, and like, so my blog post, if you read the HN comments, apparently had both of these attributes, but I mean, I'm gonna try anyway. So, uh, what I want you to take away from this this talk and the you know sister blog post is a basic conceptual scaffolding for like a mental model to how to think about Nix a little bit more clearly, so that when you start picking up different tools and and using aspects of Nix, it, it just starts to fit into a, a little a little framework for you. So the the core idea is that every single thing on your computer implicitly depends on a whole bunch of other stuff on your computer. Um, Basically, all software exists in a graph of dependencies. And normally that graph is, is not surface to you. There might be little pieces of the graph. So like, you know, your package manager might, might track a few dependencies here and there. But, but by and large, the graph has a lot of implicitness in it. And there's like little fragmented partial graphs scattered around your computer. And even there, the dependencies aren't, aren't super clear. Nix makes the whole graph very explicit. Um, so this is an example of a dependency graph in Nix. You can kind of just generate these, and it's you've got this whole thing with Ruby at the bottom, and then it traces all the way back up to libsystem or libc at the top, depending on what platform you're on, and you've got this whole ocean of stuff that actually Ruby depends on in order to run. Uh, so there's four major concepts that I think are really key to, to getting Nix at an intuitive level. There's the language, the store, the derivation, and just the general idea of sandboxing. So um, because these are all part of the, the difficulty in, in explaining Nix is that these are all really interdependent things that um, you can't, <laughs> there's no easy place to start, but I think the easiest place to start is the store. So we're gonna start there. Basically, once you've installed Nix, you have this directory at slash Nix slash store. And that has, I mean, typically, if once you've been using Nix for more than eight seconds, it'll have a whole bunch of stuff in it. But you can think of that directory as a graph, uh, a graph database, really. And every single entry in it is a node in that graph. So those nodes are immutable once they're created, meaning that uh, if you see a node in the graph database, its contents will never change as long as it's the same node name. And nodes look like kind of this thing on the third line, Nix store slash h1jm, a whole bunch of stuff, and then dash whatever it's called, really. So if a node includes references to paths in other nodes, that 
reference constitutes an edge between those two nodes. So graphs have nodes and edges, right? And this reference is what an edge is. So dissecting a path a little bit more, you have this next door bit. This is like essentially always the same. I'm gonna lie a little bit at a few points here because you can customize nearly everything, but it doesn't matter to understand. Next door is always called next door. And then there's a name trailing at the end of it. This is what the thing is actually called. This is specified when you like create the derivation. And then this is a hash of stuff. We'll talk about what it's a hash of later, but the important thing to understand is that this hash essentially specifies the contents. If this hash would change, that would mean the contents are different. If this hash doesn't change, that means the contents are functionally identical. And that's that's true if the same hash is produced on two different machines that aren't actually talking to each other. The contents will be essentially swappable and you could use them interchangeably. Um, and notably, once this node is created by Nix, you, the user, can't, or at least extremely shouldn't, uh, modify direct modify anything in it. Uh, Nix tries as hard as it can on whatever platform it's running on to prevent you from doing that. So to reiterate, like everything on your computer, all of the software exists in a directed acyclic graph, but normally it's not explicit, and Nix makes that very explicit. The Nix store is literally a graph database. And you can query it like a graph database. So you can say, Nick store, tell me all of the references of this thing called Zlib. And it'll happily return Zlib and libsystem. So Zlib has essentially no dependencies. And libsystem is really uh, the equivalent to, if you're familiar with Linux, libc. Uh, this is like the last layer between user land and the kernel. So what this essentially means is that Zlib has approximately zero dependencies. You can also query the same, well, a similar thing using a, a graph output format. So you can say, show me the full, uh, it's called the transitive closure of dependencies of Ruby. So tracing back its direct dependencies and then those dependencies and then those dependencies until you stop getting new things. And this gives you this nice graph that goes from Ruby all the way up to LibSystem. So that's the store in a nutshell. But let's talk about uh, derivation. So a derivation is fundamentally the thing that puts stuff in the next door. So a derivation gets in the next door somehow that we'll talk about later. And then it describes instructions to build other entries in the next door. So this is how Nix creates those nodes in the store. It uses derivations to describe how to build them and then builds them from those derivations. So if you look through your next door, you'll see again, a whole bunch of stuff, but some of them will probably end with .drv and that means they're derivations. If you cat those files, you will see this whole unreadable mess of garbage. But um, notably, you'll see a few hashes in here. So we've got that 76GXH one that's called demo. We've got that 5ARH one that's called bash. And then we've got that 76GXH one again. So um, we'll talk about that in a couple slides. But uh, a thing to realize is that, again, hand-waving a little bit, but that hash in the path of the demo.drv file is essentially just a hash of the contents of that derivation. So what that means is since every, okay, well, every direct dependency is mentioned in this derivation, this unreadable blob, right? You see bash, in fact, bash is the only actual dependency of this derivation, but it's mentioned by an explicit path here, and that's kind of just by definition how these things work. So since every direct dependency is mentioned in this hash, you can see that if that were to change, if, if we were to change the version of bash, that would change the contents of this blob, which would change the hash of the, the derivation. So uh, let me just quit Slack. No, I won't. Oh, well, we'll just deal with notifications if they happen. So um, uh, yeah, direct dependencies cause this hash to change. And because that bubbles through, you can see you'd have this situation where uh, a change high up in the tree bubbles through into a hash change for you know everything downstream from it. So this causes like a, a cascading rebuild of just whatever was dependent on the thing that changed. So a derivation is a recipe to build some other path in the next door, basically. It has a derivation path and an output path. The derivation path will already exist and it will reference the derivation itself. And then the output path is the thing that would get constructed if the derivation would be built. 
And just about everything in the next store, except for derivations, is created using a derivation. There's a couple exceptions too, but it's not important to understand. Um, so if we build it, we do that using you know a few different tools, but nix build is the most, I guess, obvious one. Uh, we nix build that derivation and it prints an output path. And um, notably that has a different hash from the derivation, right? That hash, again, you can think of it hand waving as like a hash of the derivation hash and the output name. A derivation output always has an output name. Most of the time it's out. Out is the default. Uh, it's only really changed when you have a derivation that has multiple outputs, which is the thing you don't really have to think about too much right now. But basically, this hash is just dependent on the derivation hash. So if you change you know, the dependency of the, the, the derivation, that changes the derivation hash, which changes the output hash. Meaning, if you change the version of bash that this demo thing depends on, it means this, ha this hash gets different, and it would output a different artifact at the end of the build. So again, this propagates all the way down the tree. So just to, to briefly cover what's like actually in a derivation, you've got outputs, which is what nodes in the store can this derivation build? We saw a single one called out in this one. Input derivations and input sources are like, what are the dependencies of this, this thing? What do I need to make sure exists? Or I, I recursively build before, before I do this one. Platform is like, is this for macOS, Linux? And what architecture, because this is typically a dependency of, of programs, but um, Nix is portable between them, right? You can copy you can copy stuff from one Nix store into another, another Nix store, and as long as the platform matches and you have all the other dependencies, it'll run. So this is how it gates on requiring a compatible architecture. And then builder args and anv are just how do I actually do the build? So if we rip apart the derivation we had before and like uh, align it with these these fields. We'll see we have an output named you know 76gxh demo. Empty input derivations and sources, which might strike you as weird because we talked about bash as a dependency, but actually it's mentioned in builder. So Nix doesn't really demand that the dependencies are mentioned in any particular place. It just whatever is mentioned in the derivation at all gets brought into the build, and then. We have, you know, our platform is x86-64 Darwin, and we are, you know, invoking the builder somehow with args and env. Now, to just dissect that a little bit, if we look at the command that we're actually running for args, it's, you know, we're calling bash, and then we're passing dash c, and then a script. That script is echo hello world into this variable out, and you can actually see in the env line at the bottom, we've got a variable called out with a path of this 76gxh demo thing. And that's the same as the output declared in the first line. So this is sort of how derivations work. You, you're required to generate something to the variable defined by out, and uh, that becomes the output artifact. So if we nix build that thing and then cat the, the thing it returns, we get hello world, which is exactly what we told it to do. So that's you know a very brief overview of derivations. Importantly, just they're the thing that generates nodes in the store, the graph. Sandboxing is the other important component here because great, we're bringing all those things into the, you know, into the derivation, but how do we make sure that actually the thing we construct uses them and not you know, some version of zlib from user local lib or whatever? So sandboxing addresses this. Um, the Nix tooling goes to great lengths in a few different ways, but, but sandboxing is the most overt of these, I guess. Only the things mentioned in the derivation are actually allowed to be accessed in the build. So the way this is implemented varies by platform. But basically, if you try to access something that wasn't mentioned in the derivation during your build, it just doesn't work. So that means that you're only going to get the, the things that were declared. Um, so recalling that the, the, the resulting hash of the path, the hash of the output and the hash of the derivation is de derived from you know, the, the contents of the derivation, essentially. That means that if you can't access anything that wasn't declared there, that means when you, when you uh, declare a dependency, you're declaring all of the dependencies, right? It, you can't bring in code that wasn't declared in the derivation, so there's no such thing as an implicit dependency in Nix. 
So that's really powerful. Dependencies have to be made explicit, which makes them necessarily part of the output hash of the software being built. And that means necessarily, if you have software that lives somewhere near Nick's store, <clears throat> it doesn't depend on stuff outside of the Nick store. And Nick knows how to track the dependencies between them, so it knows the whole total dependency closure of each piece of software, which is how you end up with things like this. There are no leaked hidden dependencies here. This fully specifies all of the dependencies of Ruby. And notably, nothing is machine dependent, right? Like other than the platform thing that says this is um, Darwin x86-64, you can move this to any, any machine that thinks it's capable of running code for x86-64 Darwin. And as long as you take the whole dependency closure and not just you know the Ruby node, um, it'll just work. You can just run it anywhere. So this is really cool for things like binary caching. Um, and also really cool for reproducibility because, um, or reliability. Things either things tend to work in Nix either everywhere and always or nowhere and never. Uh, this is really great for me as a developer tool, like as a, a tooling developer who supports you know a thousand or two thousand or whatever number of MacBooks. Um, Developers tend to break their laptops in very bizarre and unique ways, and getting a little bit further out of, of uh, like developer chaos land and into this nice little bubble of sanity is, uh, is really nice for, for managing this tooling because it reduces the number of like weird uh, um, conformality issues between all of these different machines. But especially notably, any software builder or install can be a binary download with no other prerequisites. You can just grab this whole subgraph from somebody else's machine and dump it into your, your computer and that software works immediately. There's no need to like compile or link or, or do any of this stuff that you normally have to do with, with uh, some kinds of software. And notably, like you don't even have to do some of the things that like, so for example, Ruby gems is fundamentally just like kind of like a, a grabbing a tarball and, and dumping it into a directory, but it, it somehow manages to do a whole lot of other stuff around that too, that takes, you know, tens and hundreds of milliseconds that add up. Uh, Nix has like essentially no other accounting. It just takes a tarball, you know, in whatever parallelism you ask for and dumps it into your Nix store. It's extremely fast. So this allows us to do um, a lot of like papering over other tools and replacing it with Nix-based workflows. So that was the sandbox. The language is the last part. Um, there are two really important attributes of the Nix language that make it able to do the things it does. One of these is that it's lazy evaluated and the other is that it's almost free of side effects. So we're gonna talk about lazy evaluation first. And this is an example of Nix code. So this data item is called uh, an attribute set. You can think of it as basically equivalent to like a hash map, hash table, hash, whatever you call it in your, your language of choice. But it has two members, A and B. Um, A is one and B is, you know, some expensive function call or whatever that you don't want to call all the time. So if we extract A from this, in most languages, you would expect this would invoke, you know, the function to generate B, but Nix doesn't. It returns one just about instantly because Nix defers execution of that function call until it's actually required to return a result because it defers evaluation of just about everything until it's required to return a result. The other attribute, and you'll see why these are um, related briefly. Nix has no side effects, essentially. Um, you can't do networking, really. You can't do user input, really, at all, I think. You can't do file writing, really. Uh, there's very limited output. You can do some tracing stuff. For the most part, Nix doesn't really do anything. Um, it's, it's quite limited in what you can actually do. There's a lot of pushing functions and objects and data around in this little abstract space, but the only time you can actually do anything is when you call the derivation function. Uh, see if you can guess what that does. It generates a derivation into the Nix store. So you call derivation with this set of arguments. This is, you know, this is a typical function call in Nix. We're passing it an attribute set with a few attributes, name, builder, system, and args. These are kind of like the most minimal, minimal possible uh, arguments you could pass to the derivation function, but there's a lot 
typically you'd pass a lot more. Um, and typically you wouldn't call derivation directly. There's wrappers that you normally use, but that's fine. This is just to demonstrate the one side effect in Nix, you call derivation, and then as a side effect, that you know that function returns something, but somewhere on your disk a derivation was created. And you can see that path is pretty printed as Nix store blah. And the object that you get returned is essentially the same as the object you passed in, but it now has two extra members in it, derv path and out path. And the derv path will now exist on disk already as a side effect, and the out path will not exist. And the Nix language will never make it exist because Nix doesn't Nix language doesn't build things. Um, however, you can build that derivation with other Nix tooling. So this is this is kind of like a, a nuance that it took me a while to figure out that the Nix language very very specifically does not do things. It only writes out derivations. And if you need to build a whole bunch of stuff to build a derivation, like you know a recursive tree of say 700 derivations, it'll write those all out and then return the last one. And then the, the Nix build tooling goes and recursively builds that whole subgraph or tree of, of derivations. So derv path is written, output path or out path is created if we build it. Uh, I think we basically covered this. So this this creates an interesting like dynamic where you have this you can hide this whole like kind of uh, garden of complexity behind this this fairly narrow pipe of just derivations getting output right so you you out you essentially from Nix land Nix language land you 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 give back a single derivation that can include the build instructions for this this massively complex piece that you can hide in the the description of what that that um, derivation build process is. So it creates this really interesting way to build like very abstract uh, descriptions and have a fairly constrained API for results. There's, there's a lot of really interesting possibility to build systems with Nix. Um, but just to, to kind of concretize this a little bit, we're going to talk briefly about Nix packages. So if you've used Nix at all, you've heard about Nix packages. It's the global default package repository for Nix, and it has something like 80,000 packages in it. But if you think, like, if you're familiar at all with the, the concept of a package manager, you're already thinking the wrong thing, probably. Um, Nix packages is really one big Nix expression that's essentially, at the end of the day, one big attribute set that has approximately 80,000 lazy evaluated calls to derivation. So this is, I mean, dramatically simplified, but this is kind of what Nix packages looks like, really. Um, you, you define this big attribute set, and it basically does nothing until you ask specifically for the, say, Ruby attribute, at which point it forces the evaluation of the derivation associated with Ruby, which might recursively force the evaluation, well, will uh, recursively force the evaluation of all of Ruby's dependencies, generating derivation files on disk for each of those that doesn't already exist on disk. And then it returns the Ruby derivation and the next build tooling builds it. So that's the language in a nutshell. And that's essentially Nix in a nutshell at a conceptual level. Of course, I didn't cover how to use it. That's what the rest of this playlist is about. But uh, the question remains, like, what is Shopify doing with it, right? So um, when I mentioned at the start that, that this was a, a uh, like, the, the, the de-abbreviated version of the abbreviated version of the blog post that I gave at the start of the Ship It um, show, um, I should mention that, like, I go into quite a bit of detail about what we're actually doing with Nix and showing off a lot of our developer tooling during that show. So. If you're interested in seeing that, definitely check out our engineering blog at engineering.shopify.com. Um, that show is not published yet, but when I have a link to the final version, I will put it in the, the description of this video. But uh, yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, I hope that was clear. Let me know in the comments if it was not or uh, ask questions, I'm happy to answer. And yeah, see you next time.